Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Malvika. Thank you so much for joining us live today from different parts of the world. In a few moments, we will begin today's episode of biotechnology. We're just waiting for everyone to join in. Welcome to everyone who's joining in. In a few minutes, we would be starting with today's session. All right. So this is the eighth episode of Biotechnology, an ongoing series of conversations with experts from the biotech industry. This initiative is by Premise Biotech, where we invite experts to share their thought leadership, their views on how the industry has evolved, their journeys and their perspectives on emerging trends and upcoming challenges. If you've been with us for the last seven episodes and want to keep posted on our schedule, please follow us on LinkedIn for all webinar updates. And if you've missed our past episodes and you can find all of them on our YouTube channel by the name Premise Biotech, we will add a link to both in the chat in a few moments. The topic for today's conversation is innovation in biotech. And our panelists today are Dr. Adi Elkales, founder of Trobix Bio, Mr. Ritesh Deshmukh, a popular actor and also the founder at Imagine Meats, and Mr. Aviv Wolf, founder of Remilk. From Premise Biotech, we have Dr. Prabhuda Kundu, Managing Director and Co-Founder, and Dr. Nupur Mehrotra, the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder. Before I invite Dr. Kundu and Dr. Mehrotra to share their opening remarks, I want to quickly remind you of our format. After the conversation, the session will be open for about 30 minutes for taking questions from the audience. I request the audience to kindly keep dropping in your questions in the chat box. As many questions as possible in the time frame will be taken up and shared with the panelists. Now, without keeping you waiting, I request Dr. Kundu and Dr. Mehrotra to kindly welcome our guest speakers for the day. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you so much. A very warm welcome to all our viewers and people who have joined in from all over the world. We have a fantastic panel of Aviv, uh, Ritesh, and Adi. I'd like to take the opportunity now to introduce Aviv to everyone. Aviv, himself a vegetarian, decided to quit from his previous pursuits and founded Remilk, a revolutionary food tech company that brings humanity a step closer to the next food and agricultural revolution, to stop relying on animals to produce our food. Remilk, under Aviv's leadership as the CEO, has already raised more than $11 million and has a broad team of researchers including some of the world's leading doctors and professors. Aviv, welcome to the eighth episode of Biotechnology. Nupur? Thanks, Prabhuda, and hello, everyone. A pleasure to connect back on this eighth episode where we are today talking about innovations in biotech. And it's a great, great pleasure to welcome Ritesh. Ritesh Deshmukh is a very well-established Indian artist from the movie industry. He has acted in more than 40 films till date and achieved huge commercial success. I'm sure the audiences wouldn't be able to forget some of his films like Kya Kool Hai Hum, Bluff Master, Mala Mal Weekly, and we can go on and on. He's also produced Marathi movies, namely Palak Palak, Yellow, Faster Fene, Lai Bhari, and Mauli, which have earned him formidable recognition at the box office as a producer, he has also received the prestigious National Film Award with Special Jury for the Marathi feature film, Yellow. Beyond his career as an actor, Ritesh is an architect, but most importantly, he's highly motivated about the new venture, Imagine Meets. He wishes to contribute to the awareness around the world of ethical impact of our food choices at an individual and at an environmental level both in terms of our future as societies and cultures. He wishes to foster a community by providing healthy, environmentally conscious and ethical alternatives to animal products. A very warm welcome to you, Ritesh. It's going to be an absolute delightful time 
talking to you, Aviv and Adi today. Further. Thank you. I'll take this amazing opportunity to welcome Adi. Dr. Adi Elkalez is a senior executive with proven record in leading health tech entrepreneurship and innovation for over 20 years. Having held key executive positions, Dr. Elkalez managed the development of technologies from early preclinical stages through market approval and international sales, led numerous businesses and licensing deals and strategic development activities. Dr. Elkalez is the founder and CEO of Trobix Bio, a preclinical stage biotech company developing solutions to remove the threat of antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Elkalez founded the company raising equity and non-dilutive funding to spin off from the university-based technology. Uh, previously, Dr. Elkalez served as the vice president of business development for life sciences at Ramot. He was the chief technology officer and the chief business development officer at Micromedic, a cancer diagnostic cluster company. He also served as a CEO in Zetec, including senior positions at Bioline RX, as well as in infectious diseases at XTL Bio. Dr. Elkalez holds a PhD degree from the Tel Aviv University and an MBA from the College of Management and has completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Wiseman Institute. We really are delighted to have you, Adi, with us and welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Most Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, we're all a group of entrepreneurs here and Aviv, I'll start the question with you. What prompted you to start a venture of your own and how did you think of Remilk? Um, so as Prabhuda said himself, I'm a vegetarian for almost five years now. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I can see myself as a perfect example of someone who's consuming dairy products, even though I'm highly aware of the destructiveness of this industry, um, sustainability wise, uh, ethical wise. Um, and I came to realize that if I am not able to make a transition towards a plant-based diet, the average person would most likely uh, will not be able to make it as well. And with this uh, thought in mind, I started working uh, and co-founding Green Milk to solve this uh, issue because I really love dairy. Um, and I think we should not uh, give up on those products. But having said that, it's still... We, had, we are paying such a significant uh, price to have those products in the supermarket. So Free Milk's goal is to um, bringing everyone the same uh, experience of dairy products without the downsides that are coming with, those, uh, with this industry. Thank you, Aviv. Ritesh, coming to you, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are very, very interested to know that how did you start, you know, transition and start from, for your venture and why Imagine Meats? So um, I, I was, you know, uh, you could say a carnivore and I enjoyed my meat a lot. And four years ago, I turned vegetarian. And, um, but I must admit that uh, after turning vegetarian, I did crave for my meat. And um, I was in America and I just you know, read about the whole development in plant-based meat and cultured meat. And I kept reading about it. I had the opportunity of um, even tasting some of it. And um, I realized that, you know, the Western world was developing food that was catering to what they eat. Uh, mainly burgers was something that they were developing much more than other products. And India primarily is, is not a burger eating nation. We love our burgers, but we are not a burger eating nation. We are um, a cultural, um, you know, um, diversity uh, is also there in our food. And we enjoy our kebabs, we enjoy our tikkas, we enjoy our galori kebabs and sikh kebabs and kima and, and various kinds of meats. And um, I thought that, you know, it's, it's about time that we should start developing and addressing uh, plant-based meats that would cater to Indian tastes. And uh, two years ago, we, uh, we started working on this. I had uh, the good fortune of attending the Good Food Institute conference in so uh, San Francisco. I met a lot of people, a lot of technology. It opened my eyes to 
to newer things. And I'm glad I went to that conference because it really became a focal point of meeting um, innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, and, and all the stuff that was happening. And uh, it, we started a journey through that. And um, I'm, I'm happy and proud that we really worked throughout uh, the COVID developing our uh, protein, texture protein, the right kind of texture, the right kind of flavor, the right kind of aroma to, uh, to you know, give to our fellow Indians and, you know, promote it. And we were happy to partner with ADM and their innovation lab. And um, we are on the cusp of our launch. So hopefully within a month, we should be out there looking forward to it. Absolutely. Fantastic. Super. Absolutely. Yeah. Adi, I'll bring you also the same question. Um, how did you get into starting your venture and how did Probix Bio happen? Oh, <laughs> well, thanks. It's a, it's a really fantastic uh, opening question. And uh, as, as you mentioned in the very long intro of me, I, you know, I took a very long road for, uh, uh, professionally and, and, and personally to get to this time. So, you know, I'm a PhD by training. I did my postdoc in cancer research before understanding that my passion lies beyond the academy. And I spent over the last over 20 years in the, you know, in the biotech life science. Uh, I can, you know, say mainly in three areas. So I spent eight years developing drugs, mainly biologicals. Then I, wore, I went into the cancer diagnostic space. I was a CEO of a cancer diagnostic company. I did uh, preclinical clinical development and I, did, I enjoyed a lot of international collaborations, including in India and China. We got Chinese FDA approval, started sales. And as startups fare out, you know, statistics didn't fall back and this startup didn't fare out well. So I moved to a, to, to a different position where I headed uh, business development for the tech transfer arm of Tel Aviv University called Ramot. And there I spent like, you know, almost five years of, of amazing time with researchers in, in early and amazing innovations. And I had the fortune to bring strategic deals and a lot of funding for translational research and doing, you know, in licensing, out licensing, and and uh, uh, even helping entrepreneurs open 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 startups and spin off companies. And that's when you know the the startup genes flared up again. So I decided uh, uh, to take all the uh, skill sets that I acquired and hopefully didn't forget them all during this long journey, and bring them all together, get out of the cushion chair. Uh, and become an entrepreneur. Uh, why Trobix Bio? Uh, well, again, it's a personal decision because for me, uh, uh, taking taking a technology and and uh, uh, um, going the very long road to uh, uh, you know and the heavy lifting to, to open a new startup has to fulfill some some essential criteria. And for me, it's first about the innovation and this innovation is mind boggling. I mean, if it works and it's a huge if because the risk of early startup is, is huge. If it works, it, it, it can game change the entire field and save lives. So, you know, it's a motivation. It's, it's something that drives internally. The technology itself was invented by a fantastic professor, Professor Odi Kimron from Tel Aviv University, which I came to highly respect and understand that we can work together because team is essential and synergizing is essential for this technology. And it's also a platform, which makes it even more exciting and challenging, figuring out how to make it into a great business. So it's all about embracing the challenge for me. Thank you so much. Avi, if I can come to you, you know, one of the things I would like you to sort of, if you could go a little deeper is, tell us a little bit about your endeavor of, you know, a little and how it's poised to make a difference. I mean. For many of our uh, people online and on the, on the call today on our webinar, they would really like to know is, why do you think like dairy is what you mentioned and why do you think you would be able to make a difference? Okay, so a very good question. Let me start with the high level overview of Remix and the, the technology and how the process actually works. So in a very uh, simple way without going too much into details, we're actually uh, training microbes. We're inserting uh, the different genes and code for the milk proteins into our uh, modified microbe to result in the recombinant milk proteins that are actually, in fact, uh, chemically identical uh, to the milk proteins that cows are making. And so 
we, um, and maybe I, I should have started with that, but we ha we've asked ourselves the question of what actually makes milk milk and what is it in milk that gives it the different taste and, and, and texture that we are, you know, uh, all like so much. And, and the question, the, the answer to this question is actually uh, the proteins. So as long as we are able to make the same unique milk proteins that are found in mammalian milk, we will also be able to create an indistinguishable experience uh, compared to the traditional dairy products that people are constantly eating. And so with this understanding in, in mind, we started working on different possibilities to create milk proteins. And we ended up with the, the combinant fermentation uh, process uh, that allows us to end up with the exact same proteins that cows are making, yet without using even one cell uh, coming from cows. Um, so this is quite interesting because the, 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 the fact that we have the same chemical structure, the same amino acid sequence in our... Avi, you went, Avi, you met mute. Oh, sorry. Um, so I, I, mean, I, I said that the, the fact that we are able to make chemically identical milk proteins allow us to also develop the same texture, the same physical properties that we are willing uh, to mimic, like the ability of, of cheese to stretch and to melt. Uh, things that plant-based cheese, unfortunately, are very hard uh, with, the, with the supplying. They fall short on most account uh, to, to bring us a, a, a dairy, a creamy and milky experience. Um, and so we truly believe that we are talking about the future of food because not only that this technology of recombinant protein is something that has been used commercially for more than 40 years. So, you know, we can use the, 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 the know-how and the facilities that were actually gained already, but we're also using this technology in, I think in a very, um, delicate way because we're only producing about 3.5% of the entire milk. Um, so with only 3.5% of the, of the milk, which is the proteins, we're able to create almost every dairy product in a very, in, in a very identical way in terms of texture, flavor, and, and other attributes. Um, so in this, in this sense, um, and regarding your question, I think that this technology has the ability in a relatively short period of time to bring a different uh, solution for such a huge market, for almost $1 trillion market worldwide. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Ritesh, this one uh, is for you. So when we started putting um, information on our LinkedIn and other social media channels about this episode, a lot of people came back and asked, how is Ritesh in biotech? So while you explained uh, how Imagine Meets happened, would you be able to tell us how did you make this journey, this shift in mindset as to coming in? What was the transition phase like? So um, I, I think um, primarily, the transition for me uh, was at a very personal level, you know, um, trying to shift from uh, being um, in a non-vegetarian to vegetarian and now um, to being a vegan and, and that to plant-based diet. So that transition was something at a personal journey that I wanted to do. At the same time, um, you know, Ginilia and me, um, Ginilia and my wife, we both uh, you know, founded this company together and um, she's been a huge influence on, on on me being in this direction and uh, you know we we are trying to figure out how we can blend the food science to the culinary science and um, it's, uh, it, it's it's our step towards you know being um, taking a step towards being ethical and sustainable and you know we, we need to teach this to our children um, and to our next generation that um, you know we, we think that the planet belongs to us 
but there's a time when we need to think that we belong to the planet and we need to do something for it. It's not about just taking away what we think is our right, but um, making sure that you know you're giving back to your planet and and that step starts from stomach. You know, everything you do is for your stomach. You went, you go out to earn money is to to fill your belly, and and I think once you start answering that that question that what goes in your stomach is is the right thing is the ethical thing, uh, and I think that will start answering a lot of uh, questions at the mm -hmm. same time. And I think that apart from being ethical and sustainable and um, you know, more respectful towards um, the animals. Um, it's also a good way of life for you and for your health. And and I'm sure that you know, science with with passing days is proving that um, you know, plant-based eating or um, veganism is, is is a step forward. And and I think that you know, you cannot force these choices onto people. You know, it's it's all, it's all about awareness. The the call has to come from within. Uh, and I'm like, I'm glad that it came from, for me from within and uh, through Imagine Meats, um, if we can give those choices to people, um, see, um, it's, it's about, you know, I enjoy my meat, I enjoy rather my meat because of the taste, the texture, but if, if an alternative protein, a plant-based protein is giving me the same texture, same flavor, um, without, uh, with, with me being responsible towards my planet, then why not? And if if Imagine Meats can do the same for people uh, who want to make the shift from being a non-vegetarian to flexitarian, from flexitarian to vegetarian, and if we can aid their crave their craving, um, then you know we think it'll be a good step towards a healthier planet. Absolutely, thank you. No, thank you so much. I mean, I'm really as you spoke, Ritesh. I some of I mean, being a Bengali. You know, we consider fish, I guess, as vegetarian. So sometimes I, I, I was thinking of what, what I might like to get into next. Now, uh, Adi, coming to you, some of our viewers may be entrepreneur, uh, budding entrepreneurs and young budding scientists who would be definitely curious, as you rightly said, you took a long road to come where you did. How, was it, how challenging was it to raise some of the initial investment, given the fact that you were coming to cater to a very important part of science, which is antimicrobial resistance, which meant that people are using a lot of antibiotics and therefore the microbes are getting resisted. And here you come along and say, I have something which could be worthwhile, let's raise money. If you could take a couple of minutes to take us through that route, that would be fantastic. Oh, um, okay. So uh, uh, thanks, that's, it's, 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 uh, it, 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 it's kind of a, a journey and uh, uh, perhaps first w it will be great. I, I know that there's a movie if you can s show the movie. So it's a fantastic intro into what we are doing as a company, much better than I can, you know, share it. Okay, yeah, Malvika, if you could have that. Yeah, thank you so much. So we'll now play a quick uh, movie by Trobix Bio explaining uh, their technology, please. Bacteria have become superbugs, always developing resistance to any treatment humanity has developed, causing a global crisis. Aiming to kill bacteria is simply not enough. New strategies are urgently needed. Trobix Bio is developing a platform technology that resensitizes superbugs to antibiotics. The company's lead product, TBX101, addresses the threat of hospital-acquired deadly infections, targeting the large population carrying superbugs in their gut. These superbugs create havoc in hospitals and medical centers. TBX101 is an orally available pill packed with specific DNA-carrying phage-based particles that target two of the bacteria's deadliest antibiotic-resistant genes. Identified carriers will immediately be treated by these pills. The released particles selectively inject their DNA to the targeted resistant bacteria
The injected DNA contains a CRISPR-based technology that uses a Trojan horse strategy to cut away the resistant genes and favor bacteria without these genes to survive. Using Trobic's bio-precision medicine technology, the microbiome flora will become antibiotic sensitive. Most importantly, this treatment can be given repeatedly without fear of resistance development to the Trobix bio product. Treatment with TBX 101 enables effective patient cure by using antibiotics that the bacteria are now sensitive to, reducing hospital acquired infections. The company plans to expand its product pipeline to develop products in diverse sectors such as therapeutics, consumer health, food safety, and animal health. Trobix Bio, eliminating antimicrobial resistance. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please, Adi. Yeah. So, so thanks, thanks, thanks for for uh, showing showing the video. And I think it highlights. I, I want to go back to where it all starts because. The key challenge in, in antimicrobial resistance is, is that bacteria always develop resistance to any new antibiotic humans have developed to date. And that means that because bacteria always develop resistance to any new antibiotic, killing bacteria, just simply killing bacteria is not simply enough anymore. And uh, there is a need for new strategies. And what I really loved about this technology is that it offers such a new strategy. And a key advantage of, of this technology uh, that we're developing is that it tricks bacteria to lose their antibiotic resistant gene while minimizing the possibility to develop resistance to, to our product. And by doing so, we're potentially game changing the entire approach to management of antibiotic resistance. Now, raising fund, seed funding is, 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 is always a challenge. And in this field, uh, 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 it's no less than anything else. Uh, for me, it's an exciting and at the same time challenging journey because it took us the textbook one year and 100 leads to secure the, the funding. It's people told me at the beginning, I said, no way. And yes, that's what it took. Uh, and along the road, we had setbacks. We have investors regretting on promised funds, you name it. Uh, and being a scientist by training, I'm skeptical in, you know, by training. And, and it's always hard to just sell a dream. So... So all these combined together, uh, I think, you know, um, there are three take home messages that, you know, you're asking me what to give to, uh, you know, budding startups and scientists. So, so first, it's a team effort. Uh, find your weakness, bring along people who can, can complement them. Bring people you can trust to share the burden because it's a long road. And I embrace the slogan that it's better to share the success than be a I make a gazillion of mistakes all the time. And the, the, the quest is to, to learn from it. Um, um, ask the investors for reasons why they do not invest. Sometimes you'll get an, a, a, an answer, which is a mirror reflection that you can learn from. And third is keep doing sanity checks along the way. Have you reached the time that you need to pivot? Uh, when to keep pushing forward, when to back off? There is no magic answer to this question, but the need to be objective and do your sanity checks with your teams and, uh, 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 and, and people that support you is critical along the way. Thank you so much, for Great learning, Zadi. Aviv, I'm extending the same question to you. Mm, what has your experience been and what do you think it takes for someone or an investor to believe in your idea? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so I think um, in general, the answer would probably be the team. Uh, Adi mentioned it a little bit, but people tend to think that the maturity of the startup and the, the, you know, the depth of the technology and the science behind it is probably the most important thing. I will argue on that. I think and assuming you have the right, obviously the right story and you're in the right space in the right time, having the right team would probably be the most important thing. Um, and 
and I'm not only talking about the, the like the CEO, obviously we need a co-founding team um, that is committed and is also the right team to take this, to take this job and to build a strong company. So in order to, I would say, um, convince the investor uh, to invest in the company, you should make, you should first make him trust you. And if the investor trusts you, I think you will understand that maybe you need to overcome A, B, and C before you know you're becoming uh, a large company. But because he trusts you, you understand that together with the right money and the right funding, uh, things will will sort out, and and you will manage to do so. So, so I will advise uh, um, entrepreneurs to to find the right partners, the right co-founders. Um, and I believe this is most of the, of the job that needs to be done, at least when talking about the initial uh, fundraising rounds. Um, moving forward, obviously things are changing, um, but you should start with that. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna go a little off script here. I'm gonna ask Ritesh because Ritesh, you felt because you and Janelia, your wife, first convinced you of that, I mean, was it a lot of convincing for you or like she walked in and you, we're going to do something in, you know, alternate meets or something? Was it, how, how difficult was a decision for you as well? No, so uh, actually, you know, whenever a wife tells you to do something, you have to do it. <laughs> that's universal. So that's universal. So happy wife and happy life. You know, that's, that's my motto. Um, so, uh, apart from that, I, I think uh, I, I turned vegetarian and um, post that uh, um, I, I started reading a lot. So it was about, it was the other way around. I had to tell her, you know, we should do something in, in this space. And um, it, it, it was a long journey. And like I mentioned before, uh, the food conference uh, at uh, the Good Food Institute um, was, was an eye opener. And that really inspired us that, you know, what we are thinking. See, you, you have a thought, you have an idea, but you know, we, we don't come from scientific background. You know, we, we are actors. Um, I have an agriculture background because you know, I, I still go back to my village and farm. But at the same time, you have a thought, you have an idea and you wonder you know, whether there's a possibility of this ever happening. And, and you, you go to a certain conference and then you meet so many wonderful people um, doing different, different things and different kind of innovations. Um, you know, you meet scientists, you meet companies, you meet uh, um, people who are doing wonderful things. And then you sit there and you figure out, you try to piece your zigzag puzzle, you know. Okay, can I get this from you? Can I get this thing from you? And slowly, slowly, you, you, you start to realize that your picture is actually forming. Um, there are a few things that, that probably don't work, but uh, we were lucky, like I said, that um, early on we got um, ADM's Innovation Lab. And e even then, you know, um, the kind of um, you know, texture for the meat that you want. Um, you know, chicken tikka has a different texture to a chicken kima, to, to seek kebab, and how does the flavor happen in biryani? Because um, it, it's, it, it's a 360 degree experience when it comes to, you know, if, the way we like our Indian food. You know, it's, it's the smell, the aroma, you open, the freshness, and everything. We really work a lot. And, um, you know, I was in my village in, in Latur, Babalgaon, and um, we started working with scientists in, in Berlin and America. And during lockdown, we used to have our products come down for tasting to Mumbai, quarantine, uh, get them off customs through lockdown, try to get them to Latu and, and taste it. And the iterations, you know, we worked for six months up and down. And, um, and our, our judgment towards a product was very basic how a consumer would eat, you know, I need more, more, it needs to be more fibrous, it needs to be, have more texture, or it needs to be slightly more chewy, or it's too soft, the flavor is not there, the bite needs to be slightly harder, slightly softer. And um, we were blessed with a great team of food scientists, um, and uh, they really helped us uh, throughout this journey. And um, it, it, I guess this lockdown was indeed a blessing um, for us that we reached a stage where we were re we are ready to launch now. Thank you. Nupur, you, I guess you have a follow-up question for him as well. 
I did. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, what you described, it's very important, uh, Ritesh, but how do you see this concept getting accepted by masses, you know, when we, people are used to meet? So maybe it's not so simple that one day you stop it and go ahead. And so how do you envision? No, you, you're absolutely right. You know, when um, this, when we started this, uh, with this idea, we, we were like, how are you going to convince people, you know, this, even... Even within my family, when I said plant-based meat, they were like, what's that? You know, are you, are you telling me that something made out of plant is going to taste uh, like meat? Um, are, are they going to be the soya chunks that they had had uh, a few years ago? But, you know, the food tech um, and uh, the texture of protein um, has, has changed a lot. So the kind of soya chunks uh, and that we were used to, um, you know, 10 years ago, and the kind of uh, protein that you have today for texturized, you know, um, dry extruded or high moisture extruded protein, they are, they are hugely different. You know, it's like, um, you know, Telegram to Bluetooth technology. That's the difference in terms of uh, taste and texture. And um, that's what we need to introduce. You're absolutely right. The road ahead is not easy. Um, but uh, the kind of awareness that is happening in the Western world, um, be it, you know, America, Canada, Europe, Singapore, Japan, and uh, there's a lot of chatter and there's a lot of talk within India. And I'm, and you know, we, we, we are also blessed with guilty eaters in India, you know, who eat outside but don't eat at home. Uh, you know, there are religious restrictions to a lot of them. So here you go, you know, you can take this meat at home and eat it. Uh, they don't eat on Tuesdays and some don't eat on Wednesdays and some don't eat on Saturdays. You can eat this all week long, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's plant-based, it's healthier, uh, and um, uh, hopefully um, better for you, better for the planet, better for animals. Thank you so much. Adi, there's a question for you. It's, uh, when we put it out, it came through us uh, from LinkedIn, was in this pandemic era, antimicrobial resistance becomes a key subject because apart from SARS-CoV-2, there's a other kind of things as your immunity goes down. There's a lot of other hospital related infections and so on and so forth coming up. Do you see on a long term your technology helping people who would be admitted to the hospitals and stuff like that? Would it be something you would have to do before he gets admitted or post admission, things like that? What do you think? So it's, it's a fantastic question. And I think, I think uh, one of the Sadly to say, uh, uh, services that the COVID pandemic has, it's, it's bringing to the spotlight the, the, the really urgent need to tackle future pandemics. And uh, antimicrobial resistance is indeed one of the leading pandemics. Um, the, the main, the, the, the first product, and you know, we, we may get to that and what, you know, how, how to, how to, uh, how to move forward and select your product, but our first product, TBX 101, actually. Uh, uh, addresses the, this issue of hospital acquired infection. And we're focusing on two of the main pathogens that reside innocently in many people's gut as carriers, that they bring it into the hospital. They're at risk if this uh, uh, superbug goes from their gut to their bloodstream. And that's also the number one portal of, 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 of uh, getting these 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 superbugs into the hospital and spreading hospital acquired infections. So, in terms of our vision, and that's you know that's that's I think it's a fantastic question. Our vision is that uh, uh, we're going for precision medicine. I think that's tomorrow's that's tomorrow's world is precision medicine, treating the right patients at the right time. And and in our case, it's having a simple test. It's a, it, a companion diagnostic test for anyone going into the hospital. Many people go for elective you know, surgeries or things that even before they get into the hospital to understand two things. One is, do they have, do they carry a superbug in their gut, the relevant superbug? And number two is, does our technology have the capability to transform them, to, sen to sensitize them to antibiotics? And with a positive answer to that question, they'll just take a simple, you know, hopefully simple course of two or three pills before they get admitted to the hospital or within the first 24 hours of admission and their my gut microbiome will become now sensitive to antibodies. 
Fantastic. And and that that's the vision. And of course, this sensitivity, because it's always a dynamic process, and you cannot ensure that it's not a, a vaccination. Okay, it's it's a pretreatment. It's a preventive treatment. Uh, uh, should last for the duration of the hospital uh, 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 or more, hopefully. And, and because our technology is, 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 is simply resensitizing them again and, and putting them into this in vivo selection pressure that you saw a glimpse in the movie, it's a very simple process of, of, of repeating that and, and, and extending this type of treatment. Thank you so much, Adi. Lupur. Aviv, um, you've also been a promoter of uh, flexitarian diet. And uh, so when you are looking at remilk, the recombinant milk and the actual dairy products, how do you see acceptance in terms of taste, in terms of nutrition, apart from proteins and elaborating on that? Mm -hmm. So first of all, regarding uh, taste, obviously, I think most people will agree that this is the most important thing. Um, and as much as, as I would like people to, you know, choose their products based on their sustainability and uh, environmental impact, that's probably not the case. And the average people that goes to the supermarket will buy the things that you love, that taste good, and the, that the cost is, is reasonable. Um, so this is also the two parameters that are the most important for email, bringing delicious products within an accessible and affordable price. Um, so this is what we're working on. And, and, and to elaborate a little bit on this, as you mentioned, we're, we're using milk proteins and we incorporate uh, plant-based ingredients into those products. So we're talking about plant-based oil and plant-based sugar. Um, so it's absolutely 100% lactose-free uh, and cholesterol-free. Um, so I like to think about it in a way that we're actually taking everything that is good about milk, which is mostly the, the milk proteins, the calcium, um, the minerals and the vitamins, um, but leaving apart, leaving aside the downsides of, of milk, which are the lactose, the cholesterol, antibiotics, growth hormones. Um, so in this sense, um, we're, we're building a different version, an optimized version of, of dairy ones that is much more uh, adaptive um, and relevant for human consumption. Um, so yeah, this is like regarding the, the you know, taste and the flavor challenge. This is obviously uh, on our top priority uh, alongside the, an accessible price. We, we understand and, 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 and think that once we achieve both, um, because our products are, you know, have like, it's, it's such a no brainer on every other parameter, like the sustainability part, the ethical part. So once we achieve uh, cost parity or at least a similar price uh, level alongside, um, you know, bringing delicious products, it's, an, it's a game over for, for the dairy industry. It's a no brainer to buy our product. And this is uh, what we all, walking on day and night uh, to hopefully achieve very soon. Thank you. Similar question to you, Ritesh, is, uh, would be one of affordability. I mean, I think you've also uh, gone on taste and you've already described it. A quick question will come on affordability because we see a lot of press nowadays saying alternate meats and all, you know, people are doing cultured meats and we hear the million dollar burger and there's a lot of press on that, but I'm assuming that you've already thought about what would be typical launch and are you putting it as a premium product or, or what do you think is, what are yours, if you could share some of your views, please. So what we are uh, attempting to do is we want to be affordable and accessible. So we are, of course, um, you know, worked with our partners to figure out, you know, which is the best way because, you know, if, if you become too premium, uh, then, you know, it's, it's a select few that will be having it. Uh, but um, we want, uh, apart from the big cities, we want it to be affordable for, you know, even a middle class person to go and, and eat it. So right now we are looking at uh, launching ready to eat meals. So 
you know, we're looking at biryanis and, and kebabs and keema and tikka masalas. You know, if our, our products will be based on that and affordability. I think uh, we're trying to price it um, very affordable. You know, a, a dish that you would go to a, to a, to a restaurant and order, it would be priced as, as low as that. So um, we are very conscious of our pricing and um, we are here to uh, give a good product uh, at an affordable price. So Adi, to you on a different note, uh, when we look at microbial resistance and we've uh, just seen the video of yours, could you also elaborate on other disease areas that you're targeting or the geographies that you're mainly looking at and include a little bit of how you look at the clinical trial path, working out for some of these uh, developments that you're doing. Oh, thanks. Uh, an excellent, an excellent uh, question. So we are focusing uh, uh, on 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 uh, TBX one hundred one, our first uh, product pipeline, targets two of the most high priority antibiotic resistant bacteria on the World Health Organization watch list, which are E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia. Now these superbugs create havoc in clinical settings. Uh, our product is designed to treat gut carriers of these bacteria and resensitize them as we spoke. Now the, the prevalence of such carriers varies across the globe. Uh, on average, it's around five to 10% of anybody going into the hospital. But in some cases, these numbers are dramatically higher and sometimes even reach 100%. So it, it's, it's a real issue and there is no solution to this challenge. So, you know, you, you can isolate sometimes if you're talking about nightmare bacteria, which are carriers of, of carbapenem resistant uh, uh, genes. But, but in, in the majority of cases, you cannot isolate. And even if you can isolate, it's very expensive and time consuming and not healthy to a patient going in for a hip replacement to be hospitalized and quarantined for several weeks. So we're talking about a huge unmet need, which is global. And hopefully once we develop our product and it's available, it'll reduce infections uh, across, anywhere across the world. In terms of, of, of where we are in our development and you know, going in for, tr for trials, so our plan is to initiate our first in-man clinical trials for TBX 101 in 2024. Uh, we currently have a prototype. This prototype shows very positive results on sensitizing resistant bacteria that are as isolated from actual patients in hospitals uh, alongside efficacy that we've obtained in, in, in our initial animal models. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have a, a, a clear development plan uh, with enhancing milestones for the coming years, uh, as Avi pointed out, and you know we cannot stress it enough. It's all about teamwork, and I'm lucky to have with me a team of professional microbiologists, expert drug development managers, that work together to meet these milestones, and uh, I believe they will enable us to indeed initiate our human clinical trials in 2024. Thank you. Aviv and Ritesh, I mean, it's a common question to both of you. And I think it's, again, we are seeing also a lot of questions coming back and forth on this is generally a recombinant food or an alternate food source concept gets questioned on taste, texture, viability issues. You all both have very adequately addressed, I think, all the above. But still, the question remains is, what do you feel will be some of the acceptance or regulatory challenges? Do you believe that in your field, there will be some regulatory like, uh, say for Ritesh from the food authorities or Avi from the FDA or the drug authorities being a recombinant sort of thing? I will go first because it's, it's absolutely simple. Um, it's plant-based. So um, there, there are no regulatory so, challenges as such for plant-based meat. Um, and just like any other food, um, you know, this they're, they're allowed this one. There's, there are no challenges as such. Over to you, Abhi. So in our case, it's slightly more difficult, but still it's nothing near uh, compared, you know, to the regulatory pathway needed to approve uh, several drugs or stuff that I, I'm, I'm sure Abhi 
is much more familiar with, but regarding food and, and novel food in our case, so the FDA actually, um, to our very much positive surprise, um, is very familiar with the uh, recombinant proteins in food. Um, milk, milk proteins is actually not that quite uh, uh, new um, to the FDA. Uh, we see recombinant enzymes that are used in many different industries, like, the, like in the dairy industry. Uh, I'm not sure about the number, but I think almost 95% of the enzymes used for cheese making are actually recombinantly produced. Um, yes. And we consume those every single day. So FDA has a specific pathway uh, for those types of ingredients. Um, but all in all, it's not a super complex process. Um, usually take about one year uh, to accomplish. Thank you so much. So Adi, uh, continuing with the discussion on the resistance and how we're dealing with it, there have been many other larger pharma sectors and other groups that have been trying, but we haven't seen much of the success so far. And you're developing a platform in the same area. Would you be able to tell us what probably is not uh, that we are able to focus on that we've not had much success uh, from big pharma and other sectors yet. Well, that's that's a real challenge, and 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 uh, from you know from and I've been I've been really intrigued by this question, uh, which which is uh, uh, basically you know you have a huge unmet need and why isn't there effective solutions being prompted. And uh, early on, I learned, and uh, you know, it's 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 it was a little bit discerning when I understand that that large pharma have really pulled out of this space over the last you know years, and there are very few pharma companies uh, uh, in, in this space, uh, and and that's uh, up until recently, and that's for a number of reasons, which you can collectively call the lack of prospects for profit. Um, um, and you know we can elaborate on, on what that means and why, but but antibiotics are not profitable for a lot of reasons, and and have caused over the years a decline in in R and D activities, and that had, that prom that that was the key thing that prompted what is termed today the broken antibiotic market, which describes the growing gap between this huge admin, admit need that's not getting any less, but it's just getting more and more, the lack of effective solutions and the low motivation of pharma companies to invest in the field. Now, I think that what we can see in the last two years is that this tide is changing. For example, uh, some major pharma companies have joined together recently to create a $1 billion fund called the AMR fund that aims to support products that are in advanced clinical trials. Uh, just a few days ago, a large pharma company, uh, a GSK, signed a large collaboration deal to develop products to treat bacteria and skin and acne. Governments are working for incentives that not only promote early stage R&D efforts, but also reward companies that have reached the point. And there are a lot of pull incentives now to, to, to increase sales to billions of dollars to create what's, what, you know, the profit, the return on investment that's needed to pull investors and pharma companies into the game. Uh, and of course, as we said, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic contributes to understanding. And I think uh, uh, there's a lot of buzz going on in, in this field over the last couple of years. Um, and with the advent of, of, I would say, more different strategies, because it's a combination of effort. I mean, antimicrobial resistance is a huge space of unmet need, different bacteria, different types of infections, different disease, uh, different, you know, different areas in the body. And it's a collective effort. So, you know, we believe that we have a, 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 a unique solution. Um, it won't solve the entire problem, but because it's a platform and we had to select as a small startup where to start, but we have a huge pipeline, you know, in, in, in the drawers and in discovery and plannings uh, of, of different products that we need to spring out. Uh, uh, we believe that we can offer a contribution to this, you know, to this quest. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Adi. And uh, Ritesh, I'll have a question to you from here. When uh, you were talking about uh, Imagine Meats, you talked about the taste, the processes you've been uh, following, 
and how you're bringing steaks and biryani and other foods out. So, and maybe in a month you're launching also now. What's the way people would reach out to you and how would they be able to get connected for Imagine Meats and the products? I'm sure there's a lot of curiosity in the audience here. So, uh, primarily we are looking to launch in Mumbai first. Uh, and we will be available um, all over, you know, Zomato, Swiggy Deliveries, Amazon's, Nature's Basket. Um, and so we are trying to go offline and online both at the same time. And um, slowly once you, you figure out how your consumers are reacting to your product, um, you, it's very important to listen to them, how they are, because they're always right. So you know, to figure out um, how they are reacting, because what's very important is, 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 is the taste and the texture. Yeah. The idea here, it's not about, you know, do not eat chicken, but, you know, you know, have an alternate chicken that tastes exactly the same. And if you're not the same, then we need to improve. And it's, it's food tech, you know. So like technology, every time it's going to be a version 2.0 that's going to be better than, than last time. But uh, one thing good about uh, the Indian food is, is that it, it comes with a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, so it's, it's just not the meat. It's, it's the flavor, it's it, it, biryani, the saffron, and, uh, you know, uh, even with butter chicken or chicken tikka masala or, or keema. So there, there, there's a lot that is going in and uh, we are developing, primarily, we will launch chicken and, and uh, lamb or goat meat. And um, we are developing our seafood line and at the same time, slowly, slowly, one baby step at a time. But yes, so we'll be available primarily in Mumbai, and then we will go to other cities. Thank you. I, I wonder, because we have our, our friends and panelists, fellow panelists from Israel, Ritesh, would this be also considered at kosher? I don't know. Just as a question. No, why not? Of course, you know, we, uh, we are open to any kind of, uh, you know, collaboration because I, I feel um, in, e even, uh, you know, um, there, there's so much of, um, how, how, how do I say, uh, so many Indian people living in UAE or Canada or, you know, US mm -hmm. all over the world, they, they eat fusion stuff, they eat fusion food, they have uh, the new Indian food as, as we call it, you know, they, they um, re, um, how do I say, re the, uh, the, the, the same vada pav will be a different in something and same chicken tikka will be slightly different and, you know, adapted differently. So, yes, and uh, why not, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking forward to Fantastic. Aviv and Nadia, this is a very interesting question. I, I always try and put to people that we have from you know, panels where we source from high tech areas is we see Israel as a land of innovation and people who take high risks. And, you know, that's what everyone's been describing that per square feet or whatever area, square kilometer, you, you seem to innovate the highest. What I mean, every time I do bring this question out is what is it in the culture of Israel that allows for innovation at this scale? That the fact that both of you are able to take risks and, uh, and and get things done in a manner. I mean, whoever would like to go first. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's, it's a good question. And I think you have many answers to this question. No one can really know the exact answer. That's, I would say for sure. Uh, there have been so many books written about it um, and, and yet um, the answer is still a little bit vague, I think, even uh, to myself, maybe I do can elaborate a bit further. I, I do think that um, something in, in the Israeli um, mindset, um, which is a little bit of uh, like, uh, we can do it and, and why not try to do it and not really, you know, um, sit in the office and, and do the regular um, office work uh, every day. Um, I think something uh, within the Israeli culture, the Israeli um, 
ecosystem is very entrepreneurial um, in, in, in its nature. Um, and people always try to do things by, the, by themselves. It's a very, like, I think common thing in Israel, um, even from a very early age to start thinking about startups and what should be my startup and how to build my own. So it's quite common. Um, and if I need to put my finger on, on, the, on one single reason, it's because of the unique mindset that we Israelis uh, usually have. Uh, I would love to hear Adi's thoughts on this and Adi has different opinions. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great topic. And as Aviv said, I think he said, he, said, he said it all because there are a lot of books on that trying to figure out what, what it is that drives innovation from Israel. Uh, and, and, you know, taking a different point of view and, you know, Israel is, is, is uh, the, the, the Hebrew name is Balagan. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's turmoil. Uh, and, and, uh, I mean, this year of COVID-19 uh, uh, just stresses that, you know, you, you, you enter into lockdown and people just do what, whatever they want to do. And everybody thinks that they're, you know, that, that, that they know it best and knowing it best and, you know, saying, you know, we don't take no for an answer. And uh, so, you know, you take risks and sometimes it fares out right. If you do, you know, if you have an amazing innovation, uh, um, and and uh, sometimes you you know you get infected because you took a risk and, and that's that's part of you know that's part of the uh, 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 part of the equation. I think what's going on these days is a transition to you know to to uh, uh, in addition to that, which is which is bringing a more um, ordered approach to to um, educating and and putting mindsets into young Israelis, which is which is amazing. You know, going personal for, for a second, you know, my, my eldest uh, uh, um, a couple of days ago entered into the into his compulsory service. But before entering into compulsory service, he just spent four years uh, doing um, a, a master's degree, a first degree and second degree in mechanical engineering. And that was all sponsored by the Israeli defense, uh, uh, the IDF. And now he's going into a special unit, which is a problem solving unit to solve problems on, you know, on whatever they can do. And nobody, nobody, nobody really knows about that. And this is a springboard because if you learn it early enough and you learn how to solve problems and you're trained and your mindset is on solving problems, then you go out and you springboard what is today the, you know, high tech nation. So it's a mixture of the of of the 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 I, I would say the ecosystem of you know uh, uh, making a mess out of everything and then figuring figuring it out along the road and trying to be more educated about that and you know training the young people and there's also a little maturity going on to the business these days. So, thank you. I think we are well past our time in terms of this. So uh, we would now I think like to open the question answer session. I think there are lots and lots of questions which have come in. We can, of course, realize some of the popularity of the topics that you've said. So as we close, I mean, we would be very happy to take some of the questions. And before I do that, I just thought of something is we could have Adi's technology of the fridge uh, coupled with Ritesh's meats. You can put it in that so you can have your last meal before you go to hospital and drink it down with some recombinant milk. I mean, it's, uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> I think it's time. Nupur, if it's okay with you, I think we should get Malvika on yeah. and get some of the question and answers going. I think our, our audience is excited and there are lots of questions going back and forth. I can see that. Malvika, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for this really interesting conversation. You're right. There are actually a lot of questions that have come in. I'm just going to start sharing with uh, them with you one by one. Um, this first question is... Um, for Aviv, the question is from Dinkar Sahal, who asks, would yeast be better at making milk than bacteria? Uh, so it's a very good question. Uh, if I knew the exact answer to this one as well, I would uh, be in a different place right now. Um, but uh, eventually we will, at the moment, we are uh, 
examining different types of uh, microorganisms um, in order to eventually reach, you know, the ones with the highest uh, expression rate, the highest yields. Um, so, and, and the two that men mentioned yeast and bacteria are obviously very well known in the literature and in the industry uh, for overexpressing different types of recombinant proteins. So these are two very interesting um, um, species, um, but regarding the specific question, yeah, we're, we're not yet sure which one is obviously better. Uh, Okay. Uh, Aviv, I must uh, tell you the reason is uh, there is no connection, but I know Dinkar for about 20 years. He's an extremely well known scientist in ICGV, and he spends, like us, he loves protein. So I can imagine why that, uh, that question came up. Mm -hmm. Right. The next one is from uh, Surya Das Gupta, who asks, and this question is for Adi Are you thinking to target potential pathobionts? amongst commensals and reach diseases like IBD, et cetera? So the line was disconnected. Can you repeat the, the second half of the question? Sure. So Surya Das Gupta asks, are you thinking to target potential pathobionts amongst commensals and reach diseases like IBD, et cetera? Okay. So uh, uh, I think I think you know it's it's uh, it's a fantastic question because this field is exploding and uh, I would like to make you know a, a very a very uh, a rough distinction which which uh, is cor correct as biology is most of the time but not all of the time uh, we are currently focusing on addressing infectious diseases that uh, are agents that cause a disease. Uh, an infectious disease, and these are E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia superbugs. Uh, there is a lot going on in the field of microbiome research that connects different bacteria and different compositions of bacteria to different uh, uh, indications and, and uh, uh, dysbiosis, which can cause anything from cancer, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes, etc. I would, I would take a teaser and say, these are things that we are looking into in the future of the pipeline because we are a platform. Uh, today, we're focusing on, on treating superbugs. Okay. Thank you. So this next question is from Simran Khiani and this question is for Ritesh. What would you say is the biggest difference between plant-based meat and actual meat in terms of protein? Can you still get the same amount of protein with one plant-based meal compared to actual meat? You know, um, in, in fact, um, with, with the same amount of, um, if, if you compare the weight, you might get more protein in plant-based protein than you get from actual meat. And uh, since it's plant, so it's, it's cholesterol-free, it's antibiotics-free. So that way, meat-to-meat -meat comparison, when you look at protein, it's, it's much more. Right. And another one for you, Ritesh, from Indranil Ghosh. Um, when you're considering plant-based proteins for artificial meat, for the typical umami taste, do you use any artificial flavors? How do you get the flavor right? So um, what we are trying to do is we are trying to use everything that is natural and plant-based in our uh, meal program. And we are trying to make sure that, um, um, you know, taste and texture and... Uh, Everything is set right. We have some amazing food scientists on board and amazing culinary chefs who are really working day in and day out, trying out various recipes to get it right. And uh, we hope that, that we are there. Right, right, thank you. Um, this question is for Adi uh, from Jatin Banatwala, who says, if patient is having leaky gut, how can a pill be able to heal the gut for effective absorption of antibiotics? Oh, that's an intriguing one. Um, honestly, I haven't thought of that. The, 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 the purpose of our treatment is taking uh, uh, people, identifying people that are carriers in their gut of this, these superbugs and sensitize, resensitizing the superbugs in the gut to antibiotics. Uh, 
the, 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 the treatment is not aimed at treating people that have problems in gut absorbance or otherwise, you know, they have a gut disease. Uh, uh, which which has to be treated by other means. Not not, not that's not, I think the you know the intention of what we are trying to do, at this stage. Yeah. All right. Thank you. This one's for Aviv from Amit Tavte. He says, "Is remilk in powder form or to be reconstituted in liquid form? If in powder form, can it be used as an alternate to products currently being used as powder milk? If in liquid form?" Can it be spray dried like normal milk? Yeah, so we're currently working on a dried uh, form, mostly for economical reasons. It is much easier to ship uh, a dried powder globally. Um, but what's very interesting about this powder that when you rehydrate it, you have uh, a so-called milk, not only in the, in the sense that you know, it is. Uh, it, it looks like milk, but also in the sense that it functions like milk, and that you can turn this milk into different dairy products using the same process that traditional dairy industry industry is currently using uh, to make, for example, cheese. Right. Actually, in fact, there are a lot of questions around. Uh comparison with real milk. Uh, Richard Rastogi, for example, asked that uh, milk has been considered as a complete food. Will the nutritional value be exactly the same if it's uh, from a plant source? Um, so I'll make a, a quick distinguish because um, you should, we should ask the question whether real milk uh, is actually plant-based. Um, we're actually almost like 90% water, and I guess water is plant-based, and we have uh, about 3% uh, sugar, which are plant-based, and, and another 3% uh, fats that are plant-based. And we have the proteins, which are al also around 3, 3.5%, uh, which are recombinantly produced. So I guess that, yeah, you can say real milk is plant-based. Um, and, and in this sense, yeah, I think this pretty much answers the question because uh, we're using um, those types of ingredients, so. Yeah. Right, and a follow-up question is from, um, in fact, a couple of people who ask if this is, this has been tested for allergies and intolerance from milk. So any kind of lactose intolerance, uh, does this have the same effect or not? Yeah, so we, we should make a, a quick distinguish again between lactose intolerance and a, a milk allergies, which are um, uh, associated with the milk proteins. Now, because we're using, we're actually producing the same proteins, uh, we will not recommend people with milk allergy to try our products because we're talking about the same proteins, but it's a totally different thing than, than lactose intolerance because our products are absolutely 100% lactose free. Um, and even much more lactose-free compared to the lactose-reduced products that we see in the dairy market, that, you know, the lactose was in the product and was actually being um, um, splitted through an en enzymatic process. So we still have some presence of lactose in, in those kind of products, but in our case, it's absolutely 100% um, free of lactose. All right. Thank you. Um, this question is for Radesh. Uh, do we get imagined meat products in form of cooked meals like biryani keema, like you mentioned, or we, can we get them in raw plant-based meat format and cook it at home in the way that we like? So, so currently, we are launching with ready meals. So, you know, you get to taste the meat uh, in the right kind of flavor um, and in the right setting. And once we are able to set our taste uh, and, and meet the standard that people expect it to be at. Um, then going forward, we would love to, you know, dish out raw plant-based meat, which they can cook it at home the way they want to. Thank you. I'm picking this one up for Adi. Uh, Siddhi Gupta asks, how effective is this product in eradication or prevention of bacterial biofilms 
as they are the first lines of defense of bacteria? Yeah, that is that is a fantastic question. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that we are working on really hard is, is uh, uh, addressing biofilms and biofilms, uh, uh, as 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 rightly pointed out, is 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 a defense in in, in many diseases and also uh, in environmental control, which is another uh, line that we are considering in the future on 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 uh, reducing the risks of spreading of of superbugs from the environment of hospitals to 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 the community. Um, the, the first TBX 101 has a less challenge in this regard because we're treating uh, superbugs in the gut uh, that are less in a state where they, where they produce biofilms as opposed to other areas like lung, which are rich in biofilms. Um, so, so these are, you know, uh, I think for TBX 101, we are uh, okay. Uh, with what we have, and we are, uh, we have some very interesting uh, things that we're working on to address the issue of biofilm, which will open up the door for for many new uh, products in the near future. All right, thank you. Um, this one's um, for uh, Ritesh. So this question is from Kajal Aurora, who asks: Is there any specific plant or variety of plants that have been taken for this purpose? And what kind of studies are performed to get a clearance uh, for using these plants? So um, we have actually uh, tied up for technology with, um, with ADN. And uh, currently we are using um, soy protein. And um, eventually we'll also try and mix pea protein with it. And um, the scientists are working with different kinds of proteins to see whichever suits best to the kind of texture that is needed for various kind of meats. All right. The next question is for um, Aviv. Um, this question again came up in a couple of, uh, quite, like it's a kind of like a combined question. What about the nutritional value? Is the nutritional value of milk and re-milk exactly the same? Uh, specifically, for example, Nidhi Jain asked questions, but what about things like calcium? Is enough calcium present in uh, Remote. Yeah, so uh, specifically when talking about calcium, yeah, we're adding calcium uh, to our products as well. Um, not only because of the nutritional benefits of calcium, but also because of the functionality values of calcium um, for the different uh, functionalities of milk and dairy products. For example, um, the cheese making process um, is very much dependent on the presence of calcium. Um, so, we are, so we are adding calcium as well. And I think regarding the other nutri nutritional values, uh, as I mentioned, milk proteins are the same and the other ingredients are plant-based. Okay. I think Malvika, uh, we have maybe time for one, two more questions, yeah. please. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so just um, a couple of last questions then. Um, this one is for uh, Paul, actually, this was the question was more about, just one second, okay. So can plant-based meat mimic seafood as well in taste and its texture? Maybe Ritesh, you can take this one. Yes, yes, it, it can and it does. And uh, we will soon be sending some nice Bengali fish to Prabhuda uh, and uh, convince him to let go of the fish and let them be happy in the ocean. And whatever fish you need, we'll be giving it to you. <laughs> right. Um, Aviv, this question's for you. How is Remilk unique from its competitors? Like, you know, there are multiple in the market. Why would somebody choose Remilk? Um, so if this question refers to uh, the plant-based uh, competitors, then first of all, I, I will say, we don't really see anyone as a competitor, as much as a cliche it may, may sound, but we believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. And in, in this sense, you know, we, we very much uh, uh, wish good luck to every uh, animal-free company uh, 
Uh, I'm sure where Ritish will obviously uh, agree with me on this one. Um, so I, I think maybe we need to find a different term other than competitor. I don't think we have anything uh, uh, to date, but I will say that I think compared to a plant-based um, alternative, well, mostly different, um, I, I, I think in terms of two main uh, reasons. One is the flavor and the taste and, and actually the texture of the products that are, you know, the fact that we're using real milk proteins allow us to, to bring a, a very big advantage um, to those products. And the second one is the functionality. Again, because we're using milk proteins, we're able to build milk that can also turn into uh, cheese, yogurt, and other dairy products. Um, and this is a huge advantage because I think that the, the huge gap we have today between plant-based cheese, for example, and real dairy cheese is represented mostly because of the functionality of the proteins. Um, it's almost impossible to make plant-based cheese that has the same attributes using plant uh, based proteins. Um, so those are the major differences of gray milk to other uh, dairy alternatives companies. All right, thank you. I think uh, we're towards the end um, of the Q&A round. I would like to thank the panelists for your valuable insights and interaction. Obviously, thanks are due to the audience for their participation and for sending in so many questions. But I would now like to request Dr. Kundu to, and Dr. Mehrotra to give their concluding remarks and close today's session. To the audience, don't forget to stay tuned to our LinkedIn and YouTube for all uh, future updates. Cool, please. Thank you, Malavika, and um, thank you all the audiences for wonderful question. Avi, Ritesh, and Adi, very grateful to you on behalf of uh, entire team at Biotechnology. We've had a whole group helping us, but um, uh, we're the ones who are talking to you today. I think we're very grateful that um, there is this platform where we can connect with you all, have discussions around technologies which would change the future in different ways and wish you all the success to all three of you. Pravda, for you for the closing note. Thank you so much. We're really, really grateful to you, Aviv, uh, Ritesh and Adi for this wonderful webinar and discussions and may you all succeed in your endeavors. We, see, we will be seeing three amazing technologies and companies of the future. Thank you so much. Malvika, thank you. Thank you to our backend team. Uh, you've been absolutely amazing. Please. Yeah, uh, I uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, Lopur, Prabhuda, Malvika, for having uh, us on this panel. I think, Avi, you are doing some extraordinary work. I want to congratulate you on all the things that you're doing. You are going to change um, how we look at milk, and I wish you all the best. And um, Dr. Adi, I just want to tell you that, you know, um, a few years ago when I'd gone uh, to America and um, I was at the hospital, and the doctors there told me that, you know, a uh, lot of Indians, you know, when they come to us for treatment, uh, they are antibiotic resistance, you know, because in India, primarily, wherever you go, any doctor in any village, if you have a headache, take antibiotic. If you have something, take another antibiotic. So it, after some time, if, when you go for a bigger operation or bigger deal, they're trying to work you with... With, with stuff and it, it doesn't work at all. And I'm so happy and so glad that you're really focusing your energies um, you know, onto a, a subject um, that is so, so important for world health. And I wish you all the best. And, um, and thank you very much for doing this for all of us and the entire humanity. Thank you. Wow. Well, now is my time to thank you. Thank, uh, thank everybody. It was an amazing opportunity, a great panel. And Aviv and Ratesh, you're doing amazing work. Uh, I, I, I just, you know, I'm just looking forward to tasting your, uh, uh, your products and enjoying them. So it's fantastic and uh, changing the world uh, one bite at a time. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ratesh, Adi, and everyone, everyone else. It was a real pleasure uh, taking part in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank Enjoy. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.
Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye Thank you.